going to go ahead and get started. Oh, wow. I have the voice of God. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to talk about telling your story, speaking for non-speakers, and I want to give you guys a little bit of context for what I'm trying to say. Um, I've talked to several of you today, and you have great stories to tell. I want you up here talking at the conferences, telling your stories. So I'm going to go through um, some thoughts about making sure that you can give a presentation and feeling comfortable telling your stories about what it is that you've accomplished. I am Kirsten Hunter. I'm an API evangelist at Akamai, which means I go around and I talk at conferences. And I also teach our customers how to be successful with our APIs. I work really hard on trying and trying to communicate things to technical people as well as non-technical people. I spend a lot of time translating between the two. I am Sinedra on Twitter. I am Princess Polymath on the web. I've written a book called Irresistible APIs, which is about creating APIs that developers actually want to use. Uh, it's, a, it's a handy book because uh, most of the APIs out there are pretty resistible. But let's get to, uh, let's get to speaking. A lot of times when people think about speaking at a conference, they think about academic style talks, lectures, where somebody is saying, this is what I'm trying to tell you how to do, and this is the one way to do it. We end up in a situation there where it's somewhat confrontational. Maybe someone else has a different idea how to solve that particular problem. And when they ask you the question or when they say you should have done it this way, it becomes a confrontation. Instead, what I'm suggesting is to think about the things that you've done. Think about the stories that you have. I had a problem. I solved it this way. Happiness happened for me, right? Nobody else can tell you that your story is wrong. It's your story about your experience, and it is a valuable thing to share. Here's one of the things that a lot of people feel, which is imposter syndrome. The things I've done well, they were obvious to me, so they must be obvious to everyone else. You're not an imposter. You don't have to be the little white dog in a pug suit. You can just be a little white dog or a pug. It doesn't matter. What you have to share is valuable to the people who are there to listen to you. I, as I said, I've talked to a lot of people at this conference, and each of you had something interesting to share about your work experience that I learned from. So I'm going to tell a story about the first time I did public speaking. And I'm going to date myself a little bit because uh, I wrote my first web application in 93. <laughs> I worked at SGI. We all had Mosaic on our systems. And my boss said, hey, if you get accepted to go talk at this conference in Paris, you can go to Paris. And I thought, awesome. I want to go to Paris. That sounds great. So I put in a talk thinking, there's no way I'm going to get accepted. And then I got accepted. I had to go and speak in an inter on an international stage the first time I'd ever actually given a talk. I had a 15-minute slot, and so I created a talk about this little thing that I'd created. I had 15 minutes worth of talk. I rehearsed it with my friends. I rehearsed it in front of a mirror. I rehearsed it until I was blue in the face. I knew exactly what it was I was going to say. And I got there, and I stood up in front of all the people, and I think I might have forgotten to breathe because I was able to give my 15-minute presentation in five minutes, and then I was done. Okay, so I learned a lot from that experience. Rehearsing in a mirror. When I rehearse in a mirror, it goes like this. Hi, I'm Kirsten. Wow. Does my hair really look like that? <laughs> okay, that's not a good expression. I don't want to give... Ooh. Yeah, I don't want to wear this shirt. Um, oh, no, I don't want to say it that way. It does, it's not natural. It's like talking to your computer. I actually do video classes for people. And speaking to your computer is also not natural. But rehearsing in front of a mirror, for me, does not work. Rehearsing with friends was helpful, but I knew these people. They didn't frighten me. It wasn't hard for me to tell them my script. I felt like I was rehearsing for a play, and I was able to say all the words in the right order, at the right speed, when I was in my own living room. But what actually has worked for me since then is sharing my story. Don't have a script. Instead, think about the different ways you can share your story. You're you go to the bar with your friends after work, and you say, I had this problem, and I solved it this way, and this is what happened. 
And then you go and share the story again and you say it slightly differently. You engage with your audience by looking at them and seeing what they react to. They're not a wall of people who are there to judge you. You're not performing at the Olympics. You are, in fact, telling your story to someone. You are engaging in a conversation. So you'll notice that my slides don't have a lot of words on them. That's on purpose. Uh, if you are a new speaker, it is very tempting to put a lot of words on your slides. But then what happens is you read your slides, the audience reads your slides, you're reading together, it's story time, and then the audience falls asleep. Also, you fall asleep. I mean, your brain turns off when you're no longer engaging with the topic, when you're no longer picking your words as if you're talking to a human instead of recording a play. It becomes boring for everybody. So what makes a good story? Let's, uh, let's hearken back to Steve Jobs, who's known for being a fantastic speaker. And what did he say a good story looked like? There is a problem. All of these things that, that exist or that I've tried have not worked. This other thing works well. iPad, <laughs> right? OK, so that's what a good story looks like. You state the problem that you're trying to solve or the challenge that you have. You generally talk about the things that aren't working or that are causing it to be a challenge. You talk about the thing that's working and then profit. This is a good story. And if you think about it, you tell these stories all the time. I like Haiku Deck. Haiku Deck is what I've used to construct my slides here. Good pictures back up your story. There should be a visceral reaction in the audience when you put a slide up there that it's helping them to feel what it is you want them to feel. You want them to pay attention to what you're saying, not to what you've written. But at the same time, you want them to get whatever feeling you're trying to convey. So use those pictures to back up your story. Now, I know a lot of people are going to do technical talks, and you need to put code up there. Remember, however, that when you put code up on the slide, people can't really read it, nor can they really follow it. So it's better to show them pictures and tell them where they can find your code on GitHub. Um, and, and help them to understand the why of what it is that you're doing. How many slides? I usually talk one minute per slide. On the other hand, this talk has 54 slides, and I'm going to do it in 30 minutes, but that's because there's a really fast part later on. It depends on you. You're not putting a lot of words on your slides, so you're not reading them. On the other hand, that can cause problems where you try to read the slides that only have four words on them, and then it doesn't take you a minute to do that, and you end up standing there at the end of your five-minute, 15-minute talk uh, trying to get people to ask you questions. Anxiety is a thing. Accept it. Understand it. I don't much get anxious before I talk anymore. I used to get very anxious before I talk. Try telling someone the story. Try understanding um, what it is that's making you anxious and try to make that better. Take a deep breath, do some yoga poses, do jumping jacks, sing the ABC song. It doesn't matter. Something to take your mind off of the fact that you're going to go up and talk in front of a bunch of people. So this is what I call my nemesis. This is the robot chipmunk that I became in Paris. Um, this is what happens when you rehearse a lot. It's not a race. You're not trying to get to the end of your presentation. You're actually trying to convey a message to the people in the audience. Fine, it's OK. You know, you're supposed to look all over the audience at all the different people. Find one person, talk to them. It's OK. You'll still get your point across, and you'll have that human interaction that helps you stay focused and grounded. So forgetting your lines. This is a thing that people get anxious about. I'm telling you not to have lines. Don't have lines, don't have a script. Figure out what piece of information you want to convey on each slide. Write it as a story a few times in different terms with different ideas if that helps you, or tell it to people several times if that helps you. Try to figure out what rhythm really works well for you. OK, so now I say don't have a script, and then I say, well, kind of have a script. Your first two slides, you stand up in front of the people they all look at you, and you forget how to speak. 
So go ahead and rehearse the first two slides a couple times. It's going to be, this is what I'm talking about, and this is who I am. It's going to sound a little scripted anyways. You don't usually introduce yourself to people that way. It's OK, and it'll help you get rolling on the conversation. Now here is one of the biggest things I want you to remember. When you stand up on stage, you feel like you're in, back in grade school, and you're standing up, and you are reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, or you're reciting the, the speech um, that, that some historical figure gave in front of your parents, and you're being judged. We aren't really being judged either then, but it sure felt like it. The audience is on your side. They're your friends. They want to see you succeed. They want you to be successful. The only thing you can do to fail at public speaking is to think you failed. If I say something and you guys are, are cool with it or aren't cool with it, it doesn't matter. If I, get, if I get frustrated or if I get nervous, it makes all of you nervous. Because you're here with me. You're participating with me in the talk. And so remember, the audience is on your side. And if you're nervous, go introduce yourself to people before the talk and just talk to those four people. Find people various places in the audience and just talk to the ones who you found. Here's another wonderful piece of information. Um, there are going to be people in your, in your audience that are going to have grumpy faces. It's actually probably not about you. I know it's shocking, right? You're standing on stage. What could people possibly be thinking about that has anything to do with anything other than you? We're at a DevOps conference. Half these people are on call. Right? And if they make grumpy faces, it's probably because some, someone is, is uh, cranking at them about the fact that a system isn't working correctly. Maybe they just had a fight with their best friend. It's OK. Don't talk to those people. Let them have their grump and, and, and stay away from them. Just don't look at those people. Let them be in their own space. Talk to the friendly people, the people who are smiling and engaging with you. Those are the ones who are going to get the most out of the talk anyways, and it's going to help you to stay centered. So now I'm going to tell you a story about another time when I gave a talk. And this was at uh, yet another Pearl Conference, which is now again called the Pearl Conference, but at the time it was yet another Pearl Conference. And it was in 2007. Now you'll notice the first time I told you a story about when I did public speaking, I just talked to one slide. Now I'm going to give you slides to follow along with me. And you can see there's different styles. It works fine, either one. I just want you to sort of get an idea. This is the part that goes fast. So I prepped. I made, I made uh, 42 slides. I was ready for my talk. I was really excited. I did the rehearsal thing in a mirror like a play. I hadn't really learned from 10 years earlier. Um, I thought it was going to work out really well. OK, so spoiler alert, didn't help. And it didn't help for reasons that had nothing to do with my preparation. First of all, I was in this huge room. I was in a room with the Pearl royalty. I was in the room with, with Larry Wall and Allison Randall and all these people who were, were huge personalities in the community that I was talking to. I wanted to talk to a room full of 30 people. I didn't really want to talk to a big room. So I was really nervous. So I took a deep breath. OK, I didn't bring a dongle. <laughs> Total new mistake. All right, it's OK. It's OK. Um, I found someone who had a dongle, and I put it in my system, and I got my system started, and it died. My system died. All right, great. OK, that's OK. You know, it happens. I'll just reboot. OK, no. Spinning beach balls. OK, so now it's OK. This is a Mac, right? So we got target mode back in the world of, in, in the days of FireWire. I can just use my Mac as a hard drive, and, and that'll work. I can just, yeah, because I didn't have a USB drive. It didn't occur to me that I wanted to have my slides on an external place. No, still a brick. So I'm getting a little nervous here. I'm getting a lot nervous. I was really, I was panicked, frankly. So I thought, I'll just use another system, and I'll, I'll just show the web part, because it, it was a presentation about a particular technology that I created. I just wouldn't have my slides. I could just do the demo, and that would be OK. Another deep breath. And uh, 
So my friend loaned me his system, and this was right before the iPhone came out, and he thought it would be really cool to have the trackpad on his system work like an iPhone, so I couldn't actually make the computer do anything. So, so that didn't work out very well. So another Good Samaritan saved me and brought me a USB mouse. So I was pretty sure I was gonna be okay. And, uh, and I, was, uh, I, was, I was ready. And then the network went down. <laughs> okay, so here we are. I don't have any network, I got no slides, I got no system, there's nothing. All right, what am I gonna do? I walked up to the front of the stage and I sat down on it and I told my story. I just talked to the audience. I had some friends in the audience, they threw me softballs at the end. I gave a good presentation, nobody left, everybody stayed and listened to what I had to say. The questions that other people asked indicated that they'd actually understood what it was I had to say. I didn't rush, I didn't speak too quickly, I had to be thoughtful about what it was I was saying and what it was I wasn't saying. It turns out that if you pause for what feels like an eternity to you, it doesn't feel like an eternity to the audience. I wasn't anxious anymore because, <laughs> I mean, what else could go wrong, right? I mean, what was gonna happen? I was gonna fall off the stage. So it turned out to be a really good presentation. It was actually the presentation that got me excited about public speaking. I had the opportunity to share my experience with other people, they were engaged in the topic, and it probably was a better presentation overall than if I'd actually done it with my slides and my demo. Because I had to look at the people. I had to figure out what they were listening to and what they were hearing. So I learned a different approach. Rehearsing does not work for me. It might work for you, but think about whether or not you want to treat the audience as a wall of people, or if you want to treat them as other people in the room with you who you're trying to speak to. I find it really valuable to tell my story. Yes, I am a public speaker, that's kind of my job now. I like telling my story, I like listening to myself talk. If you all left, I'd still talk. Um, it would be great. Uh, everyone in the room would love me. It's, it's awesome. So um, telling my story in different ways to different people is really important to me because that means that when I'm standing in a room with people who, have a, who do, share a different piece of context with me and are touched by different parts of my story, I can aim my story more in that direction. I understand the breadth of my story well enough to pick the pieces that are going to work the best for the people I'm talking to. The slides I use need to inspire and guide me. What was it I was gonna talk about here? Right, I need my slides to back up what I'm saying, but I really, really need them to not have all the words that I'm trying to say. More words is not better. Putting people to sleep is unpopular. So 10 years later, I love speaking. I love it. I love sharing things with people. I love inspiring people. I love having people come up to me afterwards and say, this is great. I'm totally gonna go talk at a conference now. That's my favorite. I talk and I say that this talk is for non-speakers. A lot of people are like, oh, does that mean it's for women? Yes. Also, it's for men. <laughs> it's for all of the people. Um, if there were cats and dogs that had stories, I think they should also come up and tell their stories. You do amazing things in your life. You are competent, creative, fantastic people. And you have stories to share that are going to inspire and guide other people. You can actually tell a story that goes, I, I had this problem and I tried 5,000 things that didn't work and it sucked. <laughs> That's still a great story because those 5,000 things I might think I might try, right? So it might give me an idea for a different approach. Whatever stories it is that you tell people about what it is that you do and how you solve problems, you probably have a different approach than they do and you're going to help them to come up with something creative at some future point. People love stories, all right? I could get up here and tell you this is how you do a thing. And you're gonna go to the next talk and they're gonna tell you this is how to do a thing. 
But you're going to go back and you're going to remember my problem with the beach balls. <laughs> and you're going to remember the story I told about Paris. Because it's a story. That's what we connect with. That's how our brains work. We remember people's stories. This is a conversation. You guys haven't gotten to talk yet, because I tend to dominate the room when I talk. But um, plus, it's not your turn yet. But um, this is a conversation. I always consider it a conversation between myself and the people in the room. It's not a confrontation. If you ask me a question or you say that you had a different experience, that's interesting to me. And it's interesting to the other people in the room. You're adding value to my talk. So how do you find your story? Well, when you're at a conference in the hallway track, and you start talking to someone, and you find out that you're really enjoying talking about this thing that you happened, or somebody else is telling you about something that's really interesting to you, and it gives you some ideas. That's a story. That's a conference talk right there. Talk about your successes, and talk about the challenges that you have. We're all human. We don't have the right answer every time. A lot of times, we don't have the an right answer at all for something. But help, pe help other people to get past those challenges that you have encountered. And here's the, you know, the, the uh, tweety, tweetable bit. Find your passion. Find the thing that you want to talk about. That's where your story is. All right, I usually have a kitten at the end because, you know, um, on the internet, all inter in intelligent discourse ends as soon as you post a picture of a cat. But my kitten picture didn't show up this time, so um, I'm going to take questions. So one of the best ways to get started with speaking is meetups. Um, if there's a technology that you're really passionate about, a lot of times meetups will have essentially lightning talk things where you only have to talk for about five minutes. And that's a great place to start out with, I was having trouble uh, integrating OAuth with my iPhone application, and I dealt with it with this library, and now it works. Right? It's a very, very focused talk to give. And also, you can totally salt the room with your friends at a meetup, because it's free. So you don't have to say, well, I'm going to give you guys all money so that you come to this conference and listen to me talk. You can say, there's going to be free food and beer. And you can come to talk, listen to me talk. And then I would expect for you to clap for me at the end. And if you don't, I will, I will, I will be very angry with you later. But um, so I think meetups are great. Um, also, Consider different ways to present the same information. I have a blog. I put a lot of information on my blog. I write things. And then when I give a talk about that, I have better context, and I'm better at telling the story. Toastmasters, um, do I have any opinions on groups like Toastmasters? Sorry, it's the, so everyone can hear. Um, I think Toastmasters is great. I actually can't go to Toastmasters, and I would, because I hear it's quite fun, and you get to tell jokes, and that's always fun. Um, anything that gets you comfortable speaking in front of people uh, is helpful. I think the main thing that you need to understand and that you can learn in those kinds of environments is that the people you're talking to are people and not judges. <laughs> Even in Toastmasters where they're kind of judging you, but they're, they're trying to help. And the audience is always trying to help too. All right, well, I'll be around for a little while if you guys want to ask questions or talk to me about APIs or whatever else you might want to talk to me about. Thank you very much.